Well, let's uh, open with a word of prayer, shall we? Almighty God, open your word to us as you gave a revelation to St. John. So in this revelation, reveal yourself to us as well, that we see you at work in all that is going on in the, the, the course of the world and the cosmos, that we see Christ who was crucified and who was exalted and at your right hand. Build and, and strengthen our faith and confidence in Christ through our study together. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I heard you had a good class last week, too, from um, Pastor Burkowski. And if you weren't here, or even if you were, he has he, they've left um, some really interesting little booklets that you might want to take, plus little pamphlets on all the various ministries that the South Wisconsin District is supporting locally. Here. Well, I guess they're not all local because uh, Dominican Republican, yeah. So, um, the things that the uh, the district here support. So, I encourage you to grab one of those and see. You know how how do certain missions attract your attention? You you've got. Oh, now I'm off on a tangent. We haven't even started. <laughs> if if you are a generous person and you donate to charities, what happens? Why you get on every list yeah. that has ever I see all the heads nodding, right? Um, it doesn't take long before, and and they're all worthy, or almost all of them, right? You you, you want to give to all of them, but you have to draw line. You make you make decisions about where you can give. So the same with missionaries, right? There are marvelous, wonderful missionaries all around the world. You'd love to support. How do you know which ones you're going to support? I, I don't know the answer to that definitively, but I think God just stirs something up as you see one. That's how I just kind of I latched on to Pastor Wolkema. I heard him speak, and I was just like, "Oh, I, I want to help this this guy." And so I think as you look at all the different mission projects there, you, you might not even have this in your mind, but you'll see one and you'll say, "Wow, I know Hispanic missions in Milwaukee or." Um, the chi little Chinese church that they're starting. Something, something will grab you, right? So that's kind of how that that works. Well, we're continuing our study today then in, in the uh, book of Revelation. And I think where I left off a couple of weeks ago was talking about the different ways that the book has been understood. Futurist, preterist, historicist, and idealist. Um, and the most common one that you're going to run into, that you have run into already, is which? The futurist, right. Um, and yet, interestingly, the futurist view of the book um, really didn't come into prominence until the, the 19th century. So I talked about uh, this fellow Darby from England that came to the United States that came up with a system and the system sets out kind of what the timeline is for the future. And then when you read the Bible, you plug the pieces back into the system. I don't know how much did I go into that. Let me go over some of these. and I just want to see if they're familiar to you. Some of you maybe have never heard this before. Others of you, especially if you've read books or visited your cousin in the Baptist church one day when the pastor was talking about this or something. This is all seem uh, very, very common. But I, I, I printed this out from a, um, a futurist site. So the first thing that happens is the rapture of the church. You know that word, the rapture of the church, right? So Christ, we get this from First Thessalonians, Christ descends, and then the dead in Christ, the graves are open, and the dead in Christ are resurrected. And then those who are alive, who are in Christ go up to meet him in the air. So Christ doesn't actually touch down. He never he never comes all the way down. It's like on the on the aircraft carriers, you know, when they, they used to they used to see him do the touch and goes for practices. They never actually catch the wire, you know, they're just practicing coming down and taking right off again. Christ just kind of comes down part way and then the Christians go up to meet him. And that triggers the tribulation period which lasts for seven years and in that period then is the rise of the Antichrist and the Antichrist is a particular figure, particular person um, there's the battle of Gog and Magog 
um, the armies from the the north, presumably from like Russia or something, coming down into the the Middle East that God destroys them. Um, there's the abomination of desolation. So the the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem, and something defy the Antichrist defiles the the temple somehow. And then finally, there's the Battle of Armageddon, the the Valley of Megiddo in Israel. What did someone say? It's 130 miles, or something like huge. Napoleon, I guess, looked at it and said, "Well, all the armies of the world could maneuver in this this place. It's giant, it's going to be this giant battlefield. All the armies of the earth are going to gather there to fight against God, and God comes and, and annihilates them at this Battle of Armageddon. And then there's the judgment of all the the nations." And Satan is bound, and so then at the end of the tribulation, triggers the millennial period, the thousand-year reign of Christ from, from Jerusalem. And then at the end of the millennial period, Satan is unbound and released from prison. He stirs up a giant rebellion against God, and, and Christ destroys the, the rebellion, and the end of the thousand years come, and then there's the great white throne judgment, and then the new heavens and the new earth that we read about at the end of Revelation. So there's that system. You see how it all kind of unfolds? And once you have the system, now you just read the scriptures and you just plug it into the system, the part of the system where it belongs. For example, the Old Testament lesson that we had today from the book of Micah. When somebody who believes in the futurist uh, perspective on this reads that, they're reading that as dis a description of the, I heard someone said it, the millennium period, right. So when will we beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks? When, there will, when will there be no more wars between nations? When will every man sit under his vine and under his fig tree? It's a way of saying that we'll all be prosperous and everything, or our homes will be doing great. When will that happen? Why, when Christ sets up his thousand year reign from Jerusalem and when Christ is the government he's way better than any president or prime minister or king that's out there now he's everything's going to be perfect just for a thousand years um, and the problem with all of that is that if you just read the texts themselves they don't seem, especially Revelation doesn't seem to come across that way you, you have to have the system first and then the texts fit into the system. But you just read the texts on their own, and it, it, it just doesn't present that way. I think that's one reason why it took 1,800 years for people to start to view it that way. But that's the most common way that people, Christians today, understand it. So it was kind of created by, uh, by Darby, popularized by D.L. Moody, and then, um, it really took off. I was talking, I think, when we left off last time, uh, took off by the, with the book The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I don't see my dad, but I know my dad said Hal Lindsey's still on TV today. I think he's 90 or over 90 years old. And the, the genius of Hal Lindsey is that he connects the things in this system to current events that we can see. So there's, let's say there's a news article about how all the ecumenical churches are getting together. And you've seen the things for the ecumenical churches, right? They're, they're all about togetherness and, and universality and not, not having exclusion. They love high church things, but they, they depart from the gospel. And so he reads that as the, the great Whore of Babylon, right? The false church in the book of Revelation. And so you can say, here it is, it's happening. The false church is coming together. All these ecumenical churches are coming together. I remember reading from the book, this, I, this is probably 40-some years ago since I last read it, so I, I hope I remember this correctly, but the, uh, uh, the European Union, um, the, the heads of the different states being like the, the horns on the on the great beasts. Um, each the ten toes. Is it the ten toes? <laughs> oh yeah, from Daniel's vision, right. Um, or I remember something about, uh, that talks about the army of the 200 million pe people being gathered together uh, from the kings of the east. And he find here, don't sure enough, he finds a little news clip of 
where the Chinese brag that they can put together an army of 200 million. Well, that's fulfillment of prophecy, isn't it? See, so see how he popularized it and put it all together? But then what really helped it take off was a series of books um, and movies made about those books from um, Tim LaHaye. And what was, uh, what was his, Barry Jenkins was his, his writing partner. Yes, the Left Behind series, right? Who's heard of the Left Behind series? Yeah. Most of you. Okay, good, good. Um, the Left Behind series was a huge bestseller. That became one of those books that, you know, you didn't have to go to the religious bookstore. You could go to, to Walmart and, you know, find the, 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 the book review stand or something like that and pick them up there, right? There were everywhere. Lots of people read those and were very influenced. And, it, and it's, a, it's a fictionalized story um, based upon the narrative of the, the, the futurist scheme, right? So the, the Antichrist, for example, I think is the guy from, from Romania that's handsome and popular and is able to fix the world's problems. Um, so it became very popular and it helped spread this idea. And to, to, to that extent, you know, praise the Lord. Jesus said, you know, he who is not against me is for me. I, I remember when I was in the Navy and I was um, serving with the, the Marine Corps and we were out in the field um, away from our, our base camp and a Marine comes to me one night almost in tears and his aunt sent him one of the Left Behind series books and he read it and he's in tears and he wants to become a Christian so he doesn't get left behind when Jesus comes. Well, praise the Lord. That's good. I was glad to go over the gospel with him and talk to him about what Christ did for us and having faith in in Jesus Christ. And if it took that book to get him to that point, well, that's great. Um, but if, but we're trying here to be faithful to what the, the scriptures say. So um, that futurist system is not the approach that we're taking here. So in the futurist system, in the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 3, that has to do with the church. But everything that happens after that is all in the future. None of that is relevant to us unless we happen to be the generation that's that's here at the, when the rapture comes, right? Um, oh, there's, there's, I get off on such tangents. Um, even before the Left Behind series, there was a movie back when I was a teenager um, called... Oh, I can't believe I forgot the name. Was it Thief in the Night? That was it. Thank you, Tara. Uh, yeah, A Thief in the Night. So, okay, I'm not the only one there. So I'm a teenager, and I go to see A Thief in the Night. So the, the plot of A Thief in the night, night, again, based on this scheme, is that there's this husband and wife, and the husband kind of hears a story about the gospel, and he becomes a Christian, puts his faith in Christ, and the wife's kind of like, I don't know about this. And then sure enough, one night the rapture happens. And she wakes up and she looks. Yeah, and he's gone, right? And then, so it's all about all the Christians are gone, and it's the people who are left. Because what happens to the people who are left? Well, they're going to go through the Great Tribulation. Yeah. All the bad stuff's going to happen to them. And so she goes, you know, she's looking for someone she can talk to. And she goes and she finds, guess who the pastor that preached to her husband? He's still here. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was preaching it, but he didn't really believe it, you know. So, um, anyway, I'm a teenager, and I saw that movie. And I think our youth group went to see it or something like that. And I came home, and uh, I remember I was in the bedroom, and I came out. And I went in the front room. My mom wasn't there. And I went to the base. Mom! <laughs> I go to the bed. Mom! <laughs> oh, no! Then <laughs> um, right to the refrigerator. Huh? <laughs> Nobody's watching, so... <laughs> um, 
So that's the scheme that um, most people take towards it. Um, and so the first three chapters, that applies to us. But everything after that is future. And it doesn't apply to us. Um, and when those future events occur, they're simultaneous, right? So, you know, the, you've got the, um, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments being poured out. And the idea is during the tribulation, that's what's going to happen to the people that are left. First, this is going to happen. And that's going to happen to them. Nah, 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 nah. Uh, they're, they're seen as successive. Um, so I think there's a better way to, to look at the, the text. So today, we're, um, we're going to just do a few verses here. We won't go too far. But we looked, I think, at the very first week at verses 1 through 3. So today I'd like to have us take a look at chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. So chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Is there a volunteer who would like to read that? Sure. Okay. General, okay. Thank you. John's of the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is to come from the seven spirits who are before his throne and Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings. To him who loves and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. All right. Um, so, he starts out there, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. So, what is the nature of this revelation? Why? It's a letter, isn't it? It's a letter to the churches. And it starts out the same way other epistles start out. Who it's from, and uh, who it's to, and a, a greeting. Um, so John is writing to the seven churches in Asia. Now without looking ahead, who can name the seven churches? Not <laughs> me. <laughs> Let's yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's our map, right? And you recognize you can orient on the map. Here's you know Italy, Greece, the Mediterranean Sea, Israel, Asia Minor is the area here of what is presently known as Turkey. Um, and the idea is that Paul, Paul, uh, uh, John, the author, was in Ephesus. Um, so remember, John was with Jesus. He, you know, he's he, he was a fisherman, so he's from from Galilee originally. But at some point, he goes to live in Ephesus. I know I'm always telling stories, but when I was in the Navy, we. Um, our ship did a, a, a Liberty port in Turkey, and Ephesus was only a couple miles away, so I went to the MWR officer and said, hey, can I lead a tour group to yeah. Ephesus? I'd love to see it. She said, yeah, of course. Did I tell you this already? No. So we went up there. Well, um, I'm with the group, and I get to give a Christian perspective on what's going on, but you kind of have to have a local guy. Um, and he was good. I'm not trying to run him down. But So we've got a Turkish guide who it's his job to take English speaking buses in these tours and he has a spiel that he tells them at every every part and the interesting things at Ephesus to me um, are because there's so much about Ephesus in the Bible um, I could tell you so many stories I'll get I'll get way off track on this it's fascinating but there are all kinds of original buildings from the from the first century that are still there and then there's a huge section of the town um, that whereas in the first century it was a big harbor, 
um, and, a, and it was a, 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 a huge port city that the river that runs into that harbor has over the centuries silted it up. So that whole area is basically covered covered it up, and that's why Ephesus died as a city. But it's interesting in the Bible, the book of Ephesus is, um, or the stories of Ephesus, there's the story where Paul has the riot. We stood in the actual amphitheater, and I got to tell the story to all the people in the actual amphitheater 2,000 years ago where Paul was standing right there and all this stuff happened. Wow. Fascinating. And then, well, this is a side story. I hope you don't mind me throwing this stuff in. But we also got to see like the public toilets. So you didn't have private toilets, there were public toilets. If you were rich, you got to go use these public toilets in there. You sit down in there and there's these large things of marble with little holes and you find yourself a hole and then they took us down underneath there and underneath there's like a there's like a little trough of running water. They're really great engineering, right, for 2,000 years ago. But here was the big thing. The slaves, they, this is what they said. If, am I, should I not say this with kids in the room? Am I going too far? No. no. All right. They had slaves that were down there so that when you were done, they would clean you oh. from underneath. And then we had the same reaction. We're like, oh, oh. The, the guide, he said, no, the slaves loved that job. They wanted that job. And we're like, why? why? He says, because the people up there are talking. So you're sitting on these holes and you're chatting with the guy next to you, and the slaves would overhear them say things that they could use to blackmail them later and get their slavery. You know, like, If you don't set me free, I'm going to tell your wife about this and this and this. <laughs> so they liked it, John. But all that stuff is still there. It's fascinating. But one of the things that we did, they took us to, was um, the house of Mary. So remember when Jesus was on the cross and he said to um, John, um, son, behold your mother, Woman, son, behold yeah, son, behold your mother. mother woman, behold mother. Woman, behold your son. In other words, he gave her to John to take care of after he was going to be gone. So there's a there's a tradition that John took Mary to Ephesus, and then you can go and visit the house where Mary lived. I had never heard that before, and I you know I'm not an expert in archaeology, but I had archaeology in, um, in college and seminary. So I'm trying to look this up. There's really no substantial basis for this. Um, what, the, what it turns out to be is that they did find a house that dates back to that time, and a Catholic nun in the 1800s had a dream where God told her that that was the house that Mary lived in. So I told all the people, I said, you're going to see some amazing stuff here in Ephesus. But um, don't let this one get you carried away. You know, this one was prob this is a probably a fake right here. And don't you know in our little group, there were tourists all around, and when you stand up and start talking, people just join your group. <laughs> this sweet little nun, <laughs> come and join our group. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm talking and I'm looking, and there she's smiling. <laughs> I'm telling them this all nonsense. Um, but we do have the tradition that, that John went there and took care of Mary. Um, so from Ephesus, these churches in Asia Minor, that, that would have been like, that's his circuit, right? That's, or that's his district. I mean, these are ones with which he's familiar. So why isn't he writing to the church in Jerusalem or the church in uh, uh, Corinth or something like that? Well, these are the churches where he's most familiar, um, where he's kind of connected. So let's, you remember um, Pergamum? Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Ephesus. Um, so you see them all kind of right in that in that area. He's writing to these churches. Now take a look at the text that, that John read for us. Verses 4 and 5 are a greeting, right? He's writing to these churches and saying grace to you and peace from him. So we'll look into that in more detail in a moment, but that's his greeting. Then the end of verse 5, verses 6 and verses 7, that is a doxology. He's writing there in praise 
to God. He's talking about God. And then look at verse 8. There, God is speaking. So it's God, God talking there in verse, verse 8. Um, so what do you notice just kind of as you look at it all together? The first thing I want you to notice is that it's entirely God-centered. It's the, God and Christ are all over this thing. Um, in other words, John is not going to be writing to you about how to be a successful Christian businessman. He's not writing to you about how, how, to, how to manage your finances in a Christian way. He's not writing to you about how to have a good Christian marriage. Um, he's setting up and establishing the essential centrality of God and of, of Christ. Um, and, and they're all over throughout this, this whole thing. Um, so grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the, his throne and from Jesus Christ. So he's, he's praying for grace and peace to be with these people from whom? Well, from him, first of all, from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who would that be? That would be the Father. That's God. That's right. Um, take a look down at verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. And there it's repeated, isn't it? Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Um, why, why is that significant? Do, do you remember when God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush? And Moses said, people are going to ask me what your name is. What shall I tell them your name is? Who's sending me? What, what was God's reply? I am. I am. Yeah, I am. Who I am. Tell them I am. Such. In other words, um, this idea that God is the one that always has been, is, and always will be, transcends the flow of of history. Um, we're going to see a historical book here in terms of things that happen actually in, in historical time, but the God who reveals them is beyond and outside of history. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That's a tough one. I'm not ready yet to tell you what I think that means. I'm still studying that, and uh, that, that's disputed. So I'm still, we'll come back to that later in another text, but uh, I, I'm, I'm holding off on that for now. Um, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. So what do we learn about Jesus Christ in this greeting? Well, first, Jesus Christ is the... There it is, the faithful witness. The faithful witness. Keep your finger here. Don't... Uh, don't lose this page. But let's just go back for a moment to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. John, chapter 18. John 18, verse 37. Would, would somebody read that, please? And then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. <clears throat> Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. All right, so it, it's part of the pattern of Jesus Christ that he is the witness to the, to the truth. Um, also, the word there for witness, oh, I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I bet Pastor Morse can tell us this. Um, the, the Greek word for witness is the word from which we derive what English word? I did put him on the spot. I'm terrible. I'm so ashamed. Greek was a long time ago. <laughs> and if somebody asked me a Greek question, I'd be lucky to get 10% right. Um, it's the same word from which we get our English word martyr. Martyr. Martyrus. 
So a, a martyr was somebody who gave witness to Christ by dying for Christ. Um, and so even here in the book of Revelation, there is this sense that Christ, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, we're already seeing the idea that he's one who died as part of his witness to, to God. Do we see that in other places in these four verses that we've read? Just scan it and take a look. Well, how about the very next phrase? Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. We'll talk about what that means, but in order to be the firstborn of the dead, what do you have to be first? Sorry. Dead, yes. <laughs> um, go down to um, the end of okay. verse 5. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. His blood, yes. And go to the middle of verse 7. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. pierced him. Right. So there's this sense in which the witness of Jesus um, is already entailing this idea of witnessing to the point of death, being a martyr. Now, are we going to see that later in the book of Revelation? Jesus is the witness to the Father to the point that he dies. As we go through the book of Revelation, you're going to discover that if you want to be a witness to Jesus, it is very possible that you might be called upon to die. Um, that seems so far and distant for us here in the United States because we've enjoyed so much religious freedom. Um, but how far and distant is it really? Um, we all know about the Christians that were put in the Colosseum and, you know, had animal skins tied to them and then wild dogs let loose so they would bite them. And Christians that were doused in oil and lit on fire. But that was 2,000 years ago, right? Are there any martyrs for Jesus today? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> yes. I would encourage you, in fact, um, there's a magazine. You can get it for free. Just Google this and look it up. Uh, the Voice of the Martyrs. Anyone heard it or familiar with it? A couple of you know. It's worth getting, and it's free. They'll send it to you for free. And it's it, it just documents the stories of people who are suffering, even some of them to the point of death, for their faith in Jesus Christ, um, even today. And I try to announce it when I hear about stories in Nigeria, because Nigeria is not the worst country in the world. One of the, I think it's like the 12th worst or something like that. But you keep hearing stories out of Nigeria where the, the Muslim tribesmen come in, they sweep into a village, they kill the Christians, and they leave. And um, the government says, well, we'll protect you next time. Um, we talk, Dad, do you remember this? We, uh, my, my dad and I, we were visiting my mom one of the times when she was in the hospital. And these two Catholic nuns came into the room to give communion to the woman that was in the bed next to my mom. So we talked to them. And one of them was Nigerian. She was a Catholic nun from Nigeria. Sweet woman. And I, I got to strike up a little conversation with her. And she came right out and she said, the government in Nigeria is utterly corrupt. So they say they're going to protect you, and they say they're going to help you. Don't bet the farm on it. So this, this keeps happening, that these tribesmen come in and kill the Christians. Um, it's, it's, it's quite common still, even today. And it, you might be called upon to be a martyr one day. Would you be willing to give up your life and stand firm in your faith in, in Christ? That question might come to us. Um, so verse 5 again, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Or what does that mean? Resurrection. His resurrection, right. Now, weren't there dead people who rose from the dead before Jesus? What about like Lazarus? Why wasn't Lazarus one of the firstborn? Died again. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus was raised with 
the resurrection body that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. He was raised with the body that you and I will be raised with one day when we're raised from the dead. So that's why he was the first. The first, first one to experience that. Um, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Does it say that Christ will be the ruler of all the kings? He, he is the ruler of the kings. Flip back to um, Psalm 89. Psalm 89. I, I told you when we first started this class that the book of Revelation does not have any direct quotes from the Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? And yet it's filled, probably more than any other book, it's filled with allusions and echoes of things that come out of the Old Testament. And I think we're going to stop and, and look a bunch up as we go through. Because I just find this fascinating. You discover that the Old Testament ideas and themes and language are just so infused um, that, that, that they're constantly coming out of John. I wonder how that would be for us, you know, if we were writing. How well do we know the Bible that we would find ourselves just saying stuff that's in the Bible without thinking about it? Um, it's a huge part of it. But in, in Psalm 89, take a look at verse 27. I also will appoint him my firstborn. Highest of the kings of the earth. Yes, and the highest of the kings of the earth. There's two of the things he refers to Jesus as right here in this passage. And now skip down to verse 37 for a moment. Somebody read that because I'm looking in the wrong translation here. Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. Okay, so there's that language about Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn, the ruler of the kings. All that language is coming right out of the Old Testament. You see that? Um, okay, let's go to the, uh, the doxology. Um, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he's stopping right there in the middle of this introduction to give praise to, to, to Christ. Um, so Christ loves us. What does it mean to say that Christ loves you? What does that mean? It doesn't mean that Christ gets Warm, fuzzy feelings about you. Right? I'm so worthy. Yeah, right. Because you're. So, oh, yeah. Don Carson has this great thing. He, he does this talk about um, Jesus. He's he, he's saying he's, he's imagining Jesus coming down to one of our church services and saying, "Oh, when you play your guitar for me, it just makes me feel so good." It's, it's, it's like, like Jesus doesn't look at us and think we're so wonderful and marvelous that he has these warm fuzzies about us. The love of Jesus is manifested in very concrete things. Well, I'll, go, I'll give you a little aside since we got time anyways. Um, for those of you that are married or those of you that might get married one day, yeah. um, this is really important to remember because you, you, you were commanded to love each other in the marriage, right? Um, there are going to be days where you don't feel love towards each other. Everyone's going to be, wow, is that funny? <laughs> Real love is manifested in your intentionally being committed and sacrificing for the good of that other person. There are days where you won't feel it, but if you still act in a loving way toward them, guess what happens? the feelings research and come, come back again and again. And that's the key to happy happy marriage because there's a lot of people that once the feelings are gone, they, they're like, oh, I thought that would last forever. I guess we weren't right for each other. And they're gone. Um, that's, that's not how it works. So the, the, the love of Jesus for you is manifested in 
what Jesus does for you. Let's, let's see that. Um, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And I, I could take you to other places in the New Testament where that's the case, where the love is revealed in what he does for you, that he frees you from your sins. Verse 6, and he's made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. Let's gotta keep your finger here, don't, don't lose this page, but let's go back to the book of Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. Would somebody read verse five and six, please? Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. All right, so this is God speaking to the Israelites at Mount Sinai that they were to be a special kingdom, of a kingdom of priests. In other words, the whole nation of Israel was to function in the world as priests. What do priests do? Priests are the intermediaries between people and God. They were to mediate God to the rest of the, the rest of the world. They were to bring God's word, God's message, and who God is, and God's love to the rest of the world, and be be priests for God in that sense. Well, now here's John in chapter one, verse uh, five, verse six, excuse me, telling us that God has made us a kingdom and priests. What's happened here? What's changed? This is just for Israel. Yeah, the promise that God made to Israel is now being fulfilled in the church. God's these are God's this is God's kingdom and these are God's priests now. So we have in the Lutheran church we have what we call the priesthood of all believers. That means you are a priest. In what sense does that mean you're a priest? Does that mean you uh, can't get married and you have to wear special clothes? <laughs> um, no, it means God has appointed you, designated you to be his mediator to the world, to bring God to the world and the world the world to, to God. Um, any questions about that? All right, let's, let's keep going. Um, the last part of verse 6 then, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So it's a, a beautiful doxology. You can just picture John getting caught up in this, giving praise. Have you ever felt that before when you're giving praise to God? Maybe you're singing a favorite hymn or something, holy, holy, holy. You just, you, you just get caught up in offering that worship to God. There's nothing as sweet as that. That is the sweetest and most precious thing. There's, there's no... Uh, delicious Italian food that can compare with that. There's no walk through the national park that can compare with that. There's no drug or anything that can give you a high like that. It's the most wonderful thing. And it's interesting here that the word he uses for forever and ever. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It's the same Greek word from which we get our English word eon. Eon. How long is an eon? Yeah, and it's interesting because he doesn't say for an eon, he uses it plural, for eons, and then he repeats it, it's plural of the plural, so he's saying for eons of eons, so, so the best way we can say this in English I guess is forever and ever, but it, he, he's really trying to convey here the, 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 the eternal, massive scope of this, it's forever and ever and ever. Um, he is the glory and the dominion. Um, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, 
And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. So he's, he's giving praise, and then he wants us to know something about Christ. What is the thing that he wants us to know about Christ? Behold, he is coming, coming with the clouds. Right. The whole book of Revelation is going to focus ultimately on the return of Christ. And so that defines and marks um, the maturity of God's people. It's in the scripture so much. And you, if you want to measure your spirituality, if you want to measure how you're doing as a Christian, um, think perhaps about this. How much of your life is guided and directed by the awareness that Christ is coming back again. If Christ is coming back again, that changes your whole way of, of living. How many days do you wake up in the morning and you say to yourself, this might be the day. I might meet Jesus today. I, I think our natural drift is to push it off. We don't think about it at all. But the, the, the burden of this book is to make us think about and realize He is coming. And that changes everything. Changes the way you face persecution. Changes your stewardship of the things God entrusts to you in your life. Changes your relationships in your life. Um, Christ is, is coming. And every eye will see Him. Um, even those that pierced Him. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Let's look up Zechariah 12. That's one of the big problems with the futurist view, because there's a second chance. Yeah. yeah. You can, I'll well, just wait for the tribulation starts. I'm a survivalist. I can get through that. So it does matter what I do. I can go ahead and see it as much as I want. All right. Or we'll have chance. a deathbed conversion, or no, the tribulation no. will come, and so I get a second chance. That's probably one of the biggest problems. Uh, can you hear that in the back? Yeah. Yeah, fairly. Yeah, so the idea there is that in the futurist view, when the rapture comes, all the Christians are taken up. But among the people that are left that have to go through the tribulation and suffer wrath, many of them will come to, to Christ, is the idea. 144,000 at least, right? Um, but those, that, that gives them kind of like a second chance. But the, I, I think as you read the book, Jim is right here, is, is you just read the story and again and again look at this, this idea that Christ is coming, it's not broken up into three separate comings. Christ is coming. And when he comes, that's it. That's it. Christ is coming. That's it. Um, go to Zechariah chapter 12. We're not going to have time to go through as much of this as I wanted, but uh, let's just look at Zechariah 12. Um, you get a page number, right? Oh, someone, someone needs a page number for this. Okay. Yeah. Maybe somebody could read verses 10 and 11. Or chapter? Uh, chapter 12. Zechariah 12, 10 and 11. Page 10, 16. No. And I will pour out on the house of David the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. So that when they look at me on whom and him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for yeah. Hadad Rimon in the plain <laughs> of Megiddo. All right. So there's you see that word again. Uh, once more, John is borrowing. Old Testament language, the look on the on him whom they have have pierced, and there's going to be two reactions there as they look on him whom they have pierced. Um, the the some people will grace will be poured out to them. They'll they'll weep in sorrow because their sins put Jesus on the cross. That's why he was pierced. Other people are going to suffer. Uh, there's going to be great wailing. Talks about Megiddo. What's Megiddo? 
the, the, Arm, yeah, Armageddon. That's Armageddon. Um, the, the, the giant. There'll be weeping there, but that's that's because of the great judgment. So the coming of Christ brings about two things. There'll be those who will be glad to see him. Um, and their sorrow will be that their sins caused them to be pierced. And there will be those who will be weeping and mourning because he's coming in judgment for, for them. Those who pierced him, who is that? Is that just the Jews? Is it just the Romans? It's all, it's all of us. I, 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 verse 7 for me has always been a wow moment. You know, uh, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. You know, that from that fulfillment of that Bible passage. Uh, and I guess I've, the the wailing and so on will be from those I mean everybody's going to recognize Jesus for who he is, even the unbelievers. Yes. And they're the ones who are going to wail because they didn't accept him as their Lord and Savior. Yes. And, and you know, and so for them it's that thing of I really messed up. I mean no, it's going to be that because they're going, they know where they're going to be going, you know, to eternal damnation. And, and so, you know, that's the ones, I, my, you know, from my perspective, who are going to wail are those who refused him, yeah. sinned against the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and refused to believe in him. And, and that will cause them to wail because it's going to be too late. Yes. So here in, in chapter 1, verse 7, um, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. So the idea there is, those who will be wailing because their judgment has come. And they will have, won't have any choice but to bend the knee. Amen. From the Bible passage. Yes. You know, so as we go through the book of Revelation, well, oh, I'm, I'm a minute past now. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to go fast. As we go through the book of Revelation, what you're going to see are those who are enemies of God. They make themselves God's enemies. They fight against Him. They harm His people. They destroy those that are that are his, and they contend with him, and they resist him. The idea here is that at his coming, there is going to be a judgment for them. So the the the, the kind of popular contemporary idea that we're we're all going to get to heaven one day. You know, God loves us, and so we're all going to one day get to heaven. Um, I, I'll address that at another level later, but that's not what you see in this text. It's not what you see in Revelation. There is a huge divide that takes place at the coming of Christ. La last comment. Uh, so the, the Zechariah uh, chapter 12 verse 10 uh, uh, House of David and inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's talking about the Christian church? Yeah. It's In its original setting, I think here it's talking about God's people who would be the Jews, but we've already seen how God's people has expanded now beyond the Jews to all those who are children of Abraham by faith, those who are God's people. So uh, yes, I think I think that's fair to take it that way. Yeah. All the church is called the New Jerusalem. Well, yeah. In the Bible. Yeah. An interesting question is, you know, whether there's still a role for for the, the, the physical children of, of Jacob, the Jews in the future. Most Lutherans would say, no, I think there is. But we'll talk about that another, another time. All right, thank you so much for your patience. I uh, trust and pray that you have a blessed and a wonderful week in Christ and that your confidence in Christ continues to grow, your passion and your love for Him continues to grow. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.